It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. We're going to talk about that delicate and brittle crypto technology, the elliptic curve technology that has allowed hundreds of Bitcoin wallets to be drained of their value. The latest in the Plex media server defect that caused the last pass hack and Sony's lawsuit against Quad9. All over an Evanescence album? It's next on Security Now. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 914, recorded Tuesday, March 14th, 2023. Sony sues Quad9. Security Now is brought to you by Fortra. The cybersecurity landscape is full of single solution providers, making it easy for unexpected cyber threats to sneak through the cracks. That's why Fortra created a stronger, simpler strategy for protection. They're your cybersecurity ally, working to provide peace of mind for every step of your journey. Learn more at Fortra.com. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of Teams or Enterprise Plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by Plextrack, the premier cybersecurity reporting and collaboration platform. With Plextrack, you'll streamline the full workflow from testing to reporting to remediation. Visit plextrack.com slash twit to claim your free month of the Plextrack platform today. It's time for Security Now, the show we cover the latest news in the world of security with this guy right here, our master of ceremonies, Steve Gibson. Happy Pi Day, Steve. Happy Pi Day to you, Leo. And I was saying before the show that we need a Pi Day on a Friday, but we don't, <laughs> we don't have that this time. Uh, so this week we've got fewer questions which required longer answers. Um, and so we're going to answer some questions. What, if anything, can be done about the constant appearance of malicious Chrome extensions? What's the latest country to decide to pull Chinese telecommunications equipment out what's the number one way that bad guys penetrate networks and how has that changed in the past year what delicate and brittle crypto requirement is responsible for protecting nearly one trillion dollars in cryptocurrency and tls connections and how can we trust it what's now known about the plex media server defect that indirectly triggered the exodus from LastPass? And why would the, in the world would Sony Entertainment Germany bring a lawsuit against the innocent nonprofit do-gooder Quad9 DNS provider? Well, stay tuned. The answers to questions you didn't even know you had will be provided during this March 14th, <laughs> Pi Day, 914th episode of security now how many uh how many uh, uh decimals of pi can you uh can you do off the top of your head we had a we had a serious geek in high school who used to just bore us with you know he would just <laughs> Go and on, of course on. we didn't know if he was right or wrong right it's like okay richard yeah he's yeah. at some point just saying i i can do uh because there's a mnemonic uh, I think oh. George Gamow, uh, the physicist, came up with it. How I want to drink alcoholic, of course, after the heavy chapters on quantum mechanics. So 3.141592, two, of course, after, five, wow. three, six, no, seven, Q-U-A-N-T-U-M, seven, <laughs> mechanics whatever that is <laughs> so i used to i i once upon a time i could rattle it off for like a while i thought not, you could yeah 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 that was they, that was a thing on pi day in the grade schools here when when abby was a kid some years ago they would have a memorized pi thing and the they'd have a competition to see who could memorize the most digits of pi <laughs> oh just crazy I was pretty good with uh, what was that thing that went boop and beep, and it you, the the pattern got longer every time. Uh, Morse code. Simon. 
Simon. Remember? Oh, Simon. Uh, yes. Uh, Milton, oh, Milton Bradley wow. Simon. That was a tough and, one. Yeah. And the advantage was that you it kept you, you kept reinforcing burp, what you burp, already burp, knew burp, 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 and just burp. and it only extended yeah. by one one beep each time. Then that they came out fun. with and it, you probably you would only know about this if you had kids something called bop it that was like a Simon but you had to do different motions and and rotate it around and you had same thing you had to memorize the order and it would tell you what to do and then if you got it wrong it go ow. Oh! <laughs> I'm sure there are people in our audience who remember that. Uh, I only know because, of because again, this was something the kids are into. Our show today, I should mention, we have a fine sponsor, uh, a company you may have heard of before under a different name. Today, they're Fortra. But for 40 years, they were known as Help Systems, which actually in some ways was a good name because they were known for helping organizations become more secure, more autonomous, over the years, customers uh, have told them it's gotten harder and harder to pre protect their data. You probably know that if you listen to this show at all. Cyber threats are constantly evolving to become more sneaky and more powerful than ever before. In an industry where the only constant is change, adaptability is the best way to grow in the right direction. You would agree, right? That's why Help Systems listened to their customers' concerns, problems solved, and delivered with impressive results. They're a different company today. That's why Help Systems is now Fortra, F-O-R-T-R-A, your cybersecurity ally. Now, some things don't change and should never change over the years. Fortra continues the same people-first support and the best-in-class portfolio you've come to expect from health Help uh, Systems. You probably know some of the Help Systems tools. In fact, some of you probably have used Agari or the Fish Lab solutions. We've talked about Fish Labs on the show. Uh, their quarterly threat trends and intelligence report is incredibly valuable, used all over the industry. They transformed the industry, really, by creating a stronger line of defense. I mean, 40 years ago, were we even thinking about security? But over the years, they have learned that they can do better by giving you everything you need from a single provider. And it's one of the reasons Fortra is used by all 10, the top 10 Fortune 500 banks in the world. All 10 of them use Fortra to stay secure. Uh, Fortra infrastructure powers nuclear power grids. <laughs> That's pretty important you get that right, isn't it? And other important uh, infrastructure and utility services. Fortra's key area of emphasis is where technology meets, meets people, meets humanity. That includes securing infrastructure, securing data, raising security awareness, operational support. This is important nowadays. It's really hard to get the security team you need, right? Uh, Fortra offers professional security services to supplement what you've got or even, in fact, completely replace it. Do you have a pen testing team? You have a red team? They will do pen testing services security consulting services they come in they take a look it's always good to get a outside perspective on what you're doing right social engineering services boy we need that more than ever we're all subject to spear phishing it's weird one of our newest employees i mean literally brand new he is actually our newest employee already steve you'd be interested in this got a text message from somebody purporting to be lisa laporte ceo mm. from a pennsylvania number Right now, now fortunately, and this is why Fortress is so important. Our people are well trained to think twice when they see those instead of jumping in. And he did. Thank you. And let, in fact, let Lisa know that's how I know about it. But that's they're out there. They are really aggressive. I mean, he was just added to our people page like literally a day ago, and immediately started getting spear phishing attacks. Right? Uh, they will help you do your red teaming exercises they've got managed managed security services a lot of people that's the most cost effective way to get those security professionals in the door managed detection and response managed data loss prevention ibm i security services throughout every step of your journey fortra experts are determined to help increase security maturity while decreasing the operational burden that comes with it if i had to put it in one sentence that's what they do and Fortune knows we're all more powerful when we're in it together. So they prioritize collaboration with customers throughout every step 
of their unique cybersecurity journeys. For organizations, Fortran knows the road to creating a stronger, simpler future for cybersecurity begins with a daily commitment to listening to each individual concern and providing integrated, scalable solutions. They are customer first, right? Check out all those critical solutions and experts that the Fortra family has to offer. The Gari, the Fish Lab solutions, the quarterly threat trends, an intelligence report, which is a really useful resource that provides you with an analysis of the latest findings and insights into key trends shaping the threat landscape. It's kind of like a quarterly security now, right? Fortra's approach is different. In pursuit of a better future for cybersecurity, they're driven by the belief that nothing is unsolvable. Fortra, positive change makers and your relentless ally, providing peace of mind through every step of your cybersecurity journey. Set yourself up for success. Go right now to Fortra.com. Check out one of their free trials or demos today. F-O-R-T-R-A, Fortra.com. Here's to a stronger, simpler future for cybersecurity. Visit Fortra.com to learn more. Fortra, F-O-R-T-R-A.com. You new help systems, know them now as Fortran. And we thank him so much for supporting the work Steve's doing here at Security Now. And you support us, of course, when you hear this ad and you go to Fortran.com. That helps us out a lot, too. Uh, do we have a picture? I didn't even look yet. You're going <laughs> to oh, see it for do. the first time right now. So. <laughs> so oh, God. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Set us up. What, what are we going to see here? Okay. So my, my caption for this uh is this was their solution <laughs> <laughs> and so so this and it looks kind of hazy and grainy because this is one of our listeners took a picture of the screen and and tweeted it to me and he said oh this has got to be a picture of the week and oh indeed so this is a you know you're logging in and you get to the the one time password prompt for your login and there's a field where it says enter OTP in red, but above that, apparently they're having some sort of problem. So, so it says, we are facing an SMS issue. Please use 910-296 as your one-time password. <laughs> it's, and, oh, okay. So and, and what occurred to me was, okay, first of all, uh, this is weird, you know, but... Why not just disable the one-time password challenge for like while there's a, an SMS issue, whatever that could be, <laughs> rather than hard coding the proper answer for the one-time password wow. field. Anyway, it's not a I, phishing. It couldn't be a phishing thing, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't be bad guys doing that. No, I can't see how this could do anything yeah. except just be like, well, you know, use this number because you know, we'll accept it. Now, what would really be interesting would be to remember that number and see if it still works. Like after Forever. they've got this problem, Forever. yeah. Like <laughs> after they've got this problem solved, maybe that's the back door. And uh, they thought, well, we'll you know, we'll change it. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll see an instance later in the podcast where there's a concern over people having put something in during testing and which they forgot to remove later. Um, but okay, so first. Uh, after seeing the details of another Chrome extension that was seriously compromising the privacy and security of more than 160,000 Chrome users, you know, stepping back from this, it feels as though we need a better solution than we have currently. And I don't know of what that would be, but, you know, we have a need for assuring what extensions are doing. Okay, so in this case, the extension was called, and, and, and okay, and it was a little sketchy to begin with, I guess. Uh, getcookies.txt was, was actually the name of the extension. And it was being offered by, you know, through the official Chrome web store. Um, so it had been, it had been vetted and, and approved. It allowed users to export from Chrome the content of their cookie files in the old Netscape browser cookie format for presumably so that you had a copy of it, a record of it, you know, or for like Im Im maybe Im importing it somewhere else. 
Okay, but concerns about the extension were brought to light, first of all, a couple of months ago in January, when a Reddit user discovered that beyond just allowing people to export their cookies from Chrome, and, and you know, you do that once, right, and then remove the extension. Oh, apparently p people weren't. Um, this Reddit user discovered that the extension was tracking users by collecting user and browser data and uploading it on the fly to a remote server. At the time, the Reddit user posted version 1.5.0 of the getcookies.txt extension is sending details of every page you visit, not just video sites, but every page, back to its developer at the domain ck.getcookiestext.com. He said specifically for every page you visit, it sends a unique ID for your browser installation, your browser's user agent string, which shows what OS you're using and the browser version number, your language setting, the platform you're on, the current date, time, uh, uh, and your current time zone, as well as the URL that, that you're visiting. So that's not good. The URL you're visiting with a unique ID tracking you, you know, by an extension that has no business whatsoever doing any of that. But then it later came to light that the after the version was changed, the extension was not only performing that bit of tracking that had been seen in January, I'm sorry, yeah, in January, but that it was also proactively sending entire user cookie files that you'd given it permission to acquire in the first place, sending the entire cookie files back to the extension's publisher. In an update to that Reddit user's initial posting last week, they wrote, the situation is now even worse. The extension is now also sending all your cookies to the developer too. When that was confirmed, getcookies.txt was immediately pulled from the store. But that wasn't until the extension's upgrade had been in place for some time, and many users, we don't know how many of the 160,000 who were using it, had obtained the update and probably had their entire cookie files, their, you know, all of their Chrome cookies sent to the extension's developer. You know, and of course, after all, what are we constant telling everyone they need to do? Stay current with all updates. So, update to the latest getcookies.txt. And unfortunately, that, <laughs> that hurt you rather than helped you in this case. So, you know, as we know, anytime we either explicitly enable the keep me logged in on this machine checkbox, or anytime a website chooses to do that, for us, for whatever reason, you know, on our behalf, this logged on persistence, which is a convenience, you know, significantly since now we're using the web more and more for apps and things, um, that convenience is accomplished by causing the web browser to accept and store a long life persistent cookie in our browser's cache. That cookie identifies us to the site and has the effect of keeping us logged on when you know because in individual browser events are separate transactions the cookie accompanies each one of those queries to the to, to the site which says oh yeah that's steve again so anyway since this is exactly the data that the getcookies.txt extension was caught sending home to its publisher the publisher was obtaining the static session data needed to impersonate all of the users of its extension at any of the sites where a persistent session cookie may have been set, which is increasingly what's being done because, as I said, we're using browsers more and more as apps. And since the cookie file indicates its expiration date, if any, in the future, it's trivial for the attacker to determine where you're currently logged in. That is to separate the cookies, which are just session, you know, transient session cookies and persistent cookies being used to permanently log you in. So for, for what it's worth, if by any chance you or someone you know uh, 
as one of that extension's 160,000 users, you should seriously consider taking the time to log out of any websites where you might, where you know, having some unknown bad guy logging in as you could be a problem. If you just, you know, log yourself out, that will render any of those stolen cookies that uh, that that may have been exfiltrated from you useless. And this takes us back to the question I posed earlier. Like, this is happening all the time, you know, variations on this theme. How do we solve this sort of serious problem? We want our benign browser extensions to be both powerful and capable. You know, otherwise they're not that much use to us. So they need to know how and be able to do dangerous things like have access to our browser global cookie cache. But how can we safely trust extensions from unknown authors which might have a hidden agenda? You know, I mean, obviously we're putting some trust in the vetting process, which presumably occurred in order for this thing to originally get itself listed. And even though it had a somewhat dubious purpose, even day on day one, the fact that it was then able to change what it did, like it, it earned some transient trust for being there for a while. It also earned 160,000 users. And you might be thinking that the if the extensions developer was always, you know, if their intention was always nefarious, then they may have been well they may have well been biding their time, waiting for the total user count to get up to a point where they would then incrementally change what this thing did in order to get additional information on their user base until they finally said, okay, it's time for us to cash out and grab everybody's cookie files and see what mischief we can get up to. You know, so today's browser ecosystem doesn't really provide any mechanism for deeply vetting an extensions operation. You know, I mean, that would, that would require more effort than is obviously being put in and, and may be available for free extensions created by unknown people in who knows where, um, you know, it would be prohibitively expensive to be able to fully examine every extension in detail. And, you know, to, to do that, you'd really have to provide source code, which some extension authors, you know, might feel was putting a bit of a chill on the whole idea. Are they, so, they're in JavaScript though, aren't they? Uh, or can they be bi a binary blob? They, they, there, there was some, there was some requirement that was added after this became a real problem that the that the the extensions not be obfuscated, right? Uh, like you know, not not be uh, d d uh, minimized in order to deliberately make them smaller and to cram out all all of the the text, and they and they couldn't be encrypted. But it's still, you know, I mean, you'd have to like, you have to deminimize it. You'd have to know how to unobfuscate it. And just, exactly, yeah. and read through every line right. of this thing, and 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 it's sort of clever too, because I mean, if this was always the guy's goal, then he first came up with something that needed the permission to have access to the cookie cache, and had a, you know, a a valid reason for wanting that. So that would have meant that there was all of this code in there that was, you know, Legit. reading and yeah. parsing and yeah. do, working with cookies. Right. So somebody who casually looked over the script would go, well, yeah, okay, it's doing cookie stuff. So fine. Right. right. You know, extensions are hazardous. I mean, that's what Tavis Ormandy was saying when he said, don't use right. your password extension. And now, of course, we know Bitwarden has an issue with its uh, extension uh, because right. it, it gets tricked by iframes. I, I suspect that's a problem with many ex, uh, password extensions, but right, you know, right, yeah. You know. Better so, to just use the app. Interesting problem, and yes, exactly. If you can, I mean, but at the same time, look at all the look at and how you got to cut and paste, right? Using. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which can be problematic. And, and also look look at how much we're using our browsers. Right, for, we live for, in them. Like, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I I have a ton of browser extensions on, yeah, including uBlock Origin. We've talked about that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in fact, I've got one I love. Uh, it's a it's a session it's a session save and restore for Firefox. I'll, I'll, I'll use it in order to to move all of my work in progress while I'm working on the podcast on 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 Monday here. I like save all of the tabs that I've got 
uh, in, in a cute little JSON file and send it over to my other location where I'm able to, to, op to open uh, essentially the, exactly the, the, the same state that I was in before. I guess so, remove yeah. any extension you don't need and you're not sure of. Yep. And yep. That kind of and, and here again, for example, are, is it, would it have been those, those users persistent need to export their cookies? You know, it seems to me that's a one-time thing. I don't know why you would want to, right. but, you know, install the extension, use it to export your cookies, and remove the extension. Yes. Clearly, right. 160,000 people just left it there because, oh, you know, it's not hurting me. Well, mm. except it was. Okay, so following the U.S., Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, and Britain... According to reports in German media, the German government is planning to ban the use of Huawei and ZTE equipment from their national 5G telecommunications network. German officials cited the increasingly common fears that Huawei and ZTE equipment could be used for Chinese sabotage uh, and espionage. The German government had previously given the green light for Chinese equipment to be used for its 5G network, and some has already been installed. But the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, of all things, and Russia's attempt to blackmail Germany from aiding Ukraine through its Nord Stream natural gas pipeline, <clears throat> excuse me, led to a major change of thinking in Berlin. And, you know, the reporting was that those were the factors, which seems odd. You know, Russia's not China. Uh, but, you know, apparently the two are a little too close for comfort. According to German media, telcos that previously installed 5G technology from the two vendors may be forced to rip out and replace the equipment. You know, China is understandably unhappy and said that they hope Germany will make their decision one way or the other without any outside interference, meaning primarily from the U.S. trying to be persuasive here. The collection of countries are already on various schedules to remove any existing Huawei and ZTE equipment from their networks. And, you know, I continue to be distressed uh, that this, because, you know, this seems xenophobic given the lack of concrete evidence. But the argument always is there could very well be no evidence despite equipment being compromised and congressional expert testimony confirmed that it is virtually impossible to know one way or the other. The good news is the world does appear to finally be waking up to the broad potential for the abuse of today's advanced technologies. You know, I'm hoping that what we're seeing may be just a bit of a reflexive reaction to this new awareness. You know, we've all had it right from like, for the last 18 years of this podcast, knowing what was possible. Uh, you know, back in the early days of viruses, Leo, we were often just sort of musing over the fact that all they really seemed to do was propagate. They didn't really do anything bad, but we all knew they could. And every so often one would be a low level formatter or something, which would <laughs> definitely ruin your day. Um, so I hope that this is going to calm down over time and that we'll end up get you know, reaching some, balance point, which is sane. Um, the abbreviation DFIR uh, is a term in the security industry, stands for Digital Forensics and Incident Response. And there is an annual DFIR report, which is released, uh, obviously, annually. <laughs> uh, it came out last week. The, the report contains a bunch of interesting statistics. Um, but probably the most interesting fact, because it's like maybe the most significant fact, was its breakdown of the way bad guys are still gaining their initial entry into our systems. And I've got in the show notes a, a big pie chart, which is hugely dominated by one big slice of pie. In fact, it's not a slice of pie. It's the pie left over after you take out the slices of pie. Yeah, here it's an overwhelming sea of blue, uh, which represents phishing. The total, the, the way bad guys are still getting in, holding a 69.2% share of intrusion methods, where a victim was induced to click on a link or open a document, which in every case was received via email 
either through a, a mass mailing to an to a, to an organization's employees, hoping that one of them will click on it to get in, or sometimes targeted to a specific individual, if in order to make the email, you know, more more like something that they're expecting to see. So, virtually, you know, nearly, just shy of seventy percent of the way. The, 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 the forensic studies are showing people are getting in is somebody on the inside clicking on a link, inviting the bad guys in. The DFIR report noted that as in 2021, the previous re- re- reporting period, also now last year, 2022, the majority of intrusions originated from mass email campaigns spreading malware in this way. They also noted, and I thought this was very interesting, that one of the biggest shifts in this space was the discontinuation of macro-based attacks leveraging Word and Excel, which was the result of that decision that we talked about at the time um, last year of Microsoft finally choosing to disable the default execution of macros for Word and Excel. I mean, all all they had to do and finally did was pop up a warning notice rather than just having them run by default. You know, think about how long that has been the default case and for how many years before Microsoft did not take this decision, their users, you know, Windows users were being hurt by this widespread use of default execution of macros in Word and Excel. Um, you know, throughout the years before this, we kept lamenting Microsoft, how, how they left scripting enabled in email, despite the fact that no one wanted scripting in email and only the bad guys were abusing that. That battle, that battle to finally disable scripting was won. And now at long last, we have you know, another change was made that that this report demonstrates rem- markedly changed the 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 nature of the attacks. So, uh, boy, it, it just it's again one of the one of the things we have seen in so many different ways in this podcast is the the nature of inertia. That it just inertia is amazing uh, in all of its many forms. Taking second place in the uh, intrusion entry methods uh, at 15.4% is drive-by compromises, which, so those are the watering hole attacks where a malicious website is first set up and then victims are lured to visit, um, or uh, in some cases, just opportunistic, where you know a, a malicious site is set up and, and somebody who, who jumps in compromises themselves. So that's 15.4%. The remaining two major ways of gaining entry into networks, which completes our pie, uh, they're, they're, they're actually, they share the remaining 15.4% split in half, each getting 7.7%. Um, that's um, uh, p- public-facing applications is one of those by which they actually meant the exploitation of Microsoft Exchange when you drill down in the report further, um, and the abuse of valid accounts is the other 7.7%, meaning brute force, remote desktop protocol, or SQL server uh, uh, entry in order to get onto a network. So that rounds out a whole, all the 100%. But that big blue slice of pie representing nearly 70% of all intrusions and arguably preventable. Um, it would take some effort, but it could be done. And, only, and we could hope that at some point, somebody at Microsoft will wake up one morning and say something like, hey, you know, email phishing attacks are a big problem. Why don't we, I don't know, run email in its own sandboxed virtual machine? so that bad stuff from the outside is contained and can't take over the entire machine. What do you think? Well, (laughs) maybe in another decade, we'll get uh, uh, email in a, in a protected sandbox virtual machine. Okay. Now Leo, this next one is a biggie. So I think we need to take a break. 
Uh, and then Fair we're enough. going to plow into, plow into something known as the polynance attack. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. You don't ever want your nonces to be I know poly. what a nonce is, and I don't want to be messed with. No way. You don't want polynances. Uh-uh. Security Now is brought to you by... Bitwarden. Uh, actually, we were talking about Bitwarden. I have to say it's really impressive. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that could be used at home, at work, on the go, is trusted by millions. Steve uses it. I use it. But open source is such an important thing for me. We were talking some not so many months ago about pbkdf2 and how it wasn't maybe the ideal password derivative function that there were memory hard functions like scrypt and argon2 and uh, one of our uh, listeners quexton uh did a pull request uh, on bitwarden and and provided code to add scrypt as a key derivative function and then provided code to add argon2 as a key derivative function a couple of weeks ago we were talking about this and I guess Bitwarden came back to him and said, we don't want to make it too complicated. Let's pick one. And they decided to pick Argon 2 because that was the winner of the, you know, key derivative function competition. Uh, and it's added. It's in. If you're using Bitwarden 2023.2 or later, which I am, you go into your uh, settings on the website, go to the, the advanced settings and go to keys and security, and, and you can choose your key derivative function and yes, there's PBKDF2, but there's also Argon2. I switched over. Uh, Bitwarden has sensible defaults. In fact, I did some research. Uh, everybody agrees, sensible defaults. Uh, and it's done, and it's fast, and it's and it just gives me a nice feeling. Of course, if you have a good master password, you're probably protected no matter what you do. But still, this is that's a just a nice little extra thing, and that's what open source gives you. There's another thing open source gives you. Bitwarden's basic account is free and free forever. Free forever. So, in fact, I asked them, I said, well, you're ever going to charge for this like those other guys did? And they said, no, 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 that's not our business model at all. Free forever. It's open source. We can't make, we can't charge you for it. It also means that uh, if you're running a personal account, you can have, you can host your own vault. You don't have to let them host the vault. You can host your own vault in your personal account. And there are even uh, alternative servers for that. So you can use Bitwarden's official one, although a lot of people like the Rust uh, uh, server that uh, that I think that's probably the most popular among the geeks anyway. And you can host your own vault. Look at that. It's, a, it's cool, but it's also really good. It's really good. Now, I don't have to explain to you why you need a password manager. Really, the only question in your mind should be, which one should I get? And many of us have switched over to Bitwarden. It's an easy switch. You can export your passwords, import them right in. You'll be good to go in minutes. Bitwarden makes it very easy for you to install it anywhere you work. It's completely cross-platform. There's even a command line version of it, which I played with the other day. It's awesome. Uh, and of course, because all your data is in an end-to-end -end encrypted vault. Oh, this one other thing, one other difference. They encrypt everything, even the sites you go to visit and the metadata and all that stuff. It's all encrypted. So there's no no information being leaked by Bitwarden. Now Bitwarden accounts, they announced, our, all the new accounts are starting with 600,000 KDF uh, iterations. That's what the OWASP recommendation is now. So you can continue to use PBKDF2 and it will be set fine. If you want, I set it to 2 million back when that was the only choice. Worked fine. It's fast. Argon 2 ID is now an optional alternative. Again, don't do it unless everything, every where you're using Bitwarden, you're using 2023.2 or later. Because in the earlier versions, it's it'll say, I don't know what this key derivative function is. That's nothing I know about. So you want to make sure you're up to date everywhere. A stronger master password, of course, is much more important. And Bitwarden wants you to know that than KDF iteration. So make sure you use, as I do, as Steve has explained, a long, strong, unique master password. Where did I see? Oh, <laughs> so there's a there's a video, uh, a very popular uh, video game uh, that you can play. And uh, in it, let me just uh, get the story because I want to I want to tell you the story. Right, it's called RuneScape, and uh, one of the players on RuneScape. Uh, he got it to 20,000 hours of playing it, okay? 20,000 hours of playing this game. Single character. Uh, his his name was Diddleboy. P 
apparently, according to a PC Gamer, not a notorious and not especially beloved figure in the RuneScape community. Why am I mentioning this? He got hacked. And, and they renamed his account from Diddleboy1 to Same Password Everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't reuse passwords. Uh, but with, with it's easy, with Bitwarden, you don't have to. Bitwarden will generate great, long, strong passwords according to whatever parameters you want for every site. Remember them so you never have to remember them. Autofill them if you want. Uh, it does master password security checks. New users who create their accounts on mobile apps, browser extensions, and desktop apps can automatically check for known data breaches for their master password via HIBP. That's nice. Uh, you logging in with a device is now available. That's I love this. Login requests can be initiated from browser extensions, mobile apps, and desktop apps. So you can just have, I guess, I haven't done it yet. I'm going to do it. It's like a single sign-on. Bitwarden pop up and say, you want to log into this device? Yes, I do. <gasps> That's much better. I love that. Certainly better than SMS. Uh, if you are a business, we're moving over to Bitwarden. You should take a look at their Teams organization option which is a $3 per month per user plan. Bigger organizations, I suspect we're going to use this, use the enterprise plan, $5 a month per user. Uh, there's some additional features, things like sharing private data across departments, making it easy to share passwords across departments. There's always the basic free account. Now, I started with that. I liked it so much, I decided to pay $10 a year just so I could use my YubiKey and to give them a little extra funding. There's a family plan, too. Six, up to six users, they don't even have to be in your family. Up to six users, $3.33 a month for the whole thing. That's a great deal. I do use my YubiKey uh, exclusively with my Bitwarden, which is a great feature. I love that. Look, I, it's not a question of whether you should use a password manager. It's only a question of which one you should use. In my opinion, it's a no-brainer. Bitwarden is the only open-source, cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, at work, trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. You get started right now with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free forever across all devices with unlimited passwords as an individual. Bitwarden.com slash twit. Please, I beg of you, use that address so they know you saw it here. Bitwarden.com slash twit we are huge fans of bitwarden and uh i think because it's open source it's just always going to be ahead of the competition just because users want to make it better all the time and it and it does this 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 is so exciting this argon too bitwarden.com slash twit now back to our mr gibson and okay so this his is nonsense this is not the Polynesian attack. This is the <laughs> this is the poly nonce attack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to be clear, uh, the guys at uh, Kudelski Security Research, we've spoken about them before, they've discovered a new and novel attack, which they call poly nonce, and we'll see why here shortly, uh, which enables this attack. Okay. It is available in instances where a weak pseudo-random number generator was used to create a, well, w was was used in the in the in the use of a digital signing algorithm. Um, this allowed them, among other things, to recover the private keys for hundreds of Bitcoin wallets, that which were which were. Uh, for transactions that were signed using weak pseudo random number generators. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of give away the story here in, in in their upfront summary, but I think that's a good thing to do because then you will understand where we're headed with this because this is this is going to be a bit a bit of a deep dive. You know, uh, make sure that your propeller uh, spring is what wound up on your beanie cap. So they said. In this blog post, we tell a tale of how we discovered a novel attack against ECDSA. I'll explain what that is in a second and, and, and why it's important because it's everywhere. And how we applied it to data sets we found in the wild, 
including the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks. Although we didn't recover Satoshi's private key, they said we'd be throwing a party instead of writing this blog post. <laughs> yeah, they'd be in yeah. an island somewhere. <laughs> That's right. They said we could see evidence that someone had previously attacked vulnerable wallets with a different exploit and drained them. We cover our journey, findings, and the rabbit holes we explored. We also provide an academic paper with the details of the attack and open source code implementing it so people building software and products using ECDSA can ensure they do not have this vulnerability in their systems. <laughs> and how? They, they said part of the Kodolsky security research team's activities includes looking into new vulnerabilities and exploits. A few months ago, while researching ECDSA nonce attacks, a member of our team discovered a more general way to exploit complex relations between nonces to receive to retrieve the signing key. And I'll explain a lot of this here as, as we go along. They said a review of existing literature seemed to confirm that this was indeed a novel insight. So we started digging into it. If you're interested in the math and details surrounding the attack, there's a link to the paper. Okay, so we're about to be hearing a lot about ECDSA. ECDSA is an abbreviation for elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. It is now, even still, the current state-of-the-art choice for efficiently producing a secure signature of a hash of a message where the signer's key is kept secret and they've published their matching public key, which is then used to verify their signature. So ECDSA is used everywhere. It's the algorithm used to sign Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrency blockchain transactions. It's one of the signature algorithms available to TLS connection handshakes when a site is using an elliptic curve certificate. So the exploitation of poorly chosen random nonces could and would have far-reaching consequences. Okay, so I'm not. I, I, I'm going to read what they wrote, uh, and not all of it because they'd really get into the weeds later. But and not because I expect anyone to exclaim, "Oh yes, of course, how obvious!" No, but because it will give you some sense that this was not trivial, and that these guys are geniuses. Oh, and and if you're listening to this while operating any heavy equipment. Please consider pausing your work what, you know, during this rough patch. Okay, so they wrote in a nutshell, and yeah, this is the nutshell version. They said, the attack looks at the fact that you can always define a recurrence relation among nonces used in different ECDSA signatures as a polynomial of arbitrarily high degree with unknown coefficients modulo the order of the curves generator point. <laughs> We're going to take their word for that. They said, if you have a set of N ECDSA signatures under the same private key, and this recurrence relation is of degree D, then under some caveats we'll talk about later, you can use the ECDSA signature equation to rewrite the polynomial in terms of the private key and the recurrence unknown coefficients. Okay, that was the insight that one of these guys had. Obviously, they're, they're way deep in the weeds of this. So they said, we have found that the unknown coefficients can be eliminated from the polynomial, which always has the signer's private key among its roots. So, if the degree D is low and you have enough such correlated signatures where you, the, the, the number of, of signatures is N 
and you need n to be equal to d plus 3 at least, then you can perform a key recovery attack. And, of course, that's the, the key, the, 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 uh, the, the key term here. The, this all boils down to a key recovery attack. They say by simply finding roots of a polynomial with known coefficients over a finite field, which they note is an easy task on a computer. To run the attack in practice, they said, the following is required. A minimum of four signatures generated by the same private key, the associated public key, the message hash associated with each signature, and note that all of those will be available anywhere that ECDSA is used. And they said, if the nonces, the, 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 what are supposed to be pseudo-random, completely random, they said, if the nonces obey the recurrence relation, we retrieve the private key used to generate the vulnerable signatures. They said the more signatures, the more signatures used in the attack, the slower it gets, but the more likely it is to succeed because, you know, they've got more information. They said if you attack N signatures with their N nonces, um, follow a recurrence relation of degree at most N minus 3. And the higher the degree of the polynomial, the, more, the, the slower and more difficult the attack. So the, the, But they said if you attack N signatures with their N nonces, um, uh, with a recurrence relation of de de degree at least at least n minus three, then you can perform a key recovery attack on ECDSA. Exclamation point! They wrote because that's their discovery. Okay, so you know it's big news because it means that the choice of repeated nonces, that is the the, the choice of the nonce which is used as part of elliptic curve digital signing um, must be of high quality. Uh, for any given repeated signer, their chosen nonces, um, you know, must really be random. And, by the way, must absolutely never be reused. Reusing a nonce is like the biggest no-no. So, is this related to remember when NIST kind of cracked an earlier elliptic uh, curve uh, function? Not cracked it, but provided constants. Yeah, uh, right? it, it was the the uh, the the DRB the uh, deterministic random bit generator uh, that that BSafe had uh, that RSA was publishing as their default uh, PRNG. And it was shown not to be that good. Because they used starting seeds that the NSA had specifically chosen. <laughs> yeah, they used magic numbers and didn't tell anybody where they came from. So this is not the same thing at all. Not not the same thing. Okay. Um but but so but but the but 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 so so far what we've learned is that the ECDSA is everywhere. It is the preferred fast, small, digital signature algorithm, and it, it, where it is known to be exquisitely sensitive to the quality of the nonces, a nonce must be chosen for each signature, and they have to be chosen well. What these guys have, what their inspiration was, they basically came up with the attack of if the nonces were not being chosen well, now we know actually how to take advantage of that. Ah, so I wonder if I can get it in my wallet this way. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. Okay. So right. you can sort of think of it as the price of doing business with ECDSA. Yes, it's a terrific algorithm. It's super secure using very short keys. But it's also quite finicky. It's well known that even a single inadvertent reuse of an ECDSA nonce will completely expose 
the signer's private key. You know, you still got to do a bunch of math, but it is available. So you reuse a nonce and you sacrifice all of the money in your cryptocurrency oh. wallet. Oh, this wouldn't be too. useful for me, though, because they're look, they can't choose the wallet that they want to look at. They need to look at all of them and look for matches, right? Is that kind of the way they're um, doing it? If you couldn't just if, give them a okay, wall and say, is this easy to crack? Um, if you ever transacted with that wallet, if, if I you have, yes, then there's a possibility oh. because the earlier uses, which is when you and I both were mm -hmm. messing with this it's in the beginning, that's why I forgot the password. Yeah. There tended to be a reuse of private keys in theory, ECDSA, you should all you should have an ephemeral private key also for each signature. You you, you should just make one up because the you're able to then tell people what the public key is. You keep the private key secret, but you don't need to always use the same private key. Back in the beginning, we were tending to do that. Uh -huh. You were probably doing that. Yeah, I was using the Bitcoin, defi you know, default. Yeah, uh, uh, Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin I think Core. Is the, is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, good. There's hope. They said, we, yeah. <laughs> this, may they be said, a, this may be a quarter of a million dollar show for me. Okay, keep going, keep going. <laughs> they said, we tested the attack on a specially crafted set of signatures to verify that it works. It does. In simpler words, they said, what our attack means is that every time an ECDSA signature is generated, the signature itself gives us a relation between the nonce and the private key. If the nonces are truly randomly generated, this should never be a problem because the chance that a number of nonces picked at random fit on a low degree polynomial recurrence relation is negligibly small. But there's a catch, they said. Nonces are usually output by a pseudo random number generator rather than being really random. And PRNGs are deterministic algorithms with relatively low complexity. In the best scenario, the PRNG used is complex enough and cryptographically secure, meaning among other things, that any polynomial correlation between its outputs will have such an astronomically large degree that you can safely consider it ind indistinguishable from truly random. But, they said, weak PRNGs are basically everywhere. Take, for example, the simple case of a linear congruential generator that they said uh, LCG, which is the typical textbook introduction to PRNG implementations. LCGs are to PRNGs what wrote 13 is to encryption <laughs> and, and one, two, three is to secure passwords. <laughs> okay. Good, good. In other words, <laughs> not, good. not, yeah, <laughs> not good. And they said, despite that, due to their simplicity and popularity, they're the default choice for many non critically secure applications. And even that I would be skeptical of. And they said, and it is totally possible that a placeholder LCG implementation slipped into production code mm. without being replaced by a secure one. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt. I'm going to do a little segue here for a minute because I happen to like linear congruential number generators. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about them and how I just used one, and then we'll get back to this. So um, they are... They're very handy for many purposes, but in no way imaginable would anyone consider them secure for any purpose. The entire LCNG, Linear Congruential Number Generator Algorithm, is to simply take the current seed, you know, the, the previous number generated, multiply that by a fixed number, whose binary representation has a complex bit pattern, and sometimes a prime number is used, although it's not necessary, then add a second constant value. That's it. And that's its attraction. A single multiplication followed by, by a constant number 
followed by a single addition by a different constant. So it's not random at all. Oh, God, no, Leo. It's just not it obvious not... where it came from. But in, Exactly. Yeah. It's it, Basically, it's jumping forward in the in, in 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 its number space by a certain amount so you know uh on the negative side it's entirely predictable given any output it's possible to immediately produce all future and even all previous outputs because <laughs> oh, you, you run it backwards <laughs> wow you know it's awful so as a source of randomness the term random you know doesn't apply at all uh, it should never. There should never be an R anywhere near it. Um, what it has going for it, however, is speed, since nothing could produce a noisy pattern of data faster, which is why, as it happens, Spinrite received one a few months ago. Um, and since I think everyone will find this interesting, I'll take a minute to explain. A couple of months ago, we hit an unexpected problem with Spinrite. When some very troubled hard drives would encounter some damage they could not handle. Now, the proper behavior would be for the drive to stop the transfer and return an error code, along with the number of sectors that were successfully transferred prior to that error, to, prior to it encountering that error. That's in the API, that's in the spec, that's what hard drives are supposed to do. And that would allow Spinrite to then zero in on the one sector that tripped it up. And, you know, uh, then it would work to recover that sector's data. That's what Spinrite does. So, as I said, that's what drives are supposed to do. But it turns out that many drives, which our testers have, will just hang and wait for Spinrite to time out the, to, got, to give up and time out the transfer. Or sometimes they'll return a command aborted error without any indication of where they were when they became upset. So now we had a problem. Previous versions of Spinrite, all previous versions of Spinrite, which did all of their work through the system's BIOS, were therefore limited to the BIOS's maximum 127 sector transfers, which is about 64K. So Spinrite would drop out of transferring those 64K blocks at a time and switch over to single sector mode to locate whatever the, wherever the trouble was that might be occurring uh, at that particular sector. It would, so it would just switch over to and do them one sector at a time to find the problem. Well, that worked great for finding one or more troubled sectors within 127 possible problem sector block. But 6.1 achieves its tremendous speed increase by transferring 32,768 sectors at once, which is 16 megabytes rather than 64K. So dropping out of that to switch over to one sector at a time was really no longer an option. I mean, it would <laughs> take forever. So... The solution to this dilemma is why I added a simple linear congruential number generator to Spinrite. Spinrite zooms along, running at, a, at the maximum speed that the drive can go, transferring 16 megabytes at a time until it hits a problem. If the drive returns the number of sectors that were successfully transferred as it should, then Spinrite immediately zeroes in on that sector, works on its recovery, reaches a, con a conclusion, then resumes the interrupted transfer with the next sector after the one that caused the interrupt. But if the large transfer stumbles without indicating where among those 32,768 sectors that were requested, Spinrite uses its new linear congruential number generator. What it does is it fills that 16 megabyte transfer buffer with one sector of noise pattern repeated over and over 32,768 times. Now Spinrite has a known pattern of noise throughout the transfer buffer. So it re-requests the same 16 megabyte transfer. And this time 
when the drive craps out without saying where, Spinrite can determine that for itself. It scans forward through that transfer buffer, searching for the first sector that matches the noise sector pattern. That will be the first sector in the transfer that was not overwritten by the drive's successful reading of sectors. So that's where the transfer was interrupted. And that's the sector that Spinride then needs to work on recovering. That's so, quite clever. That's cool. It's it's so cool. But it has and to be random or you wouldn't know, you wouldn't be sure that you were in the right sp place. Exactly. You yeah. it has to be random or you wouldn't be sure that the drive might not have contained that data that that, that sector of data uh, and yeah. you and you get a false positive match. So, if anyone's been wondering how all this time is being spent, there's an example. Uh, 6.1 is going to be far better than Spinrite, that, than any Spinrite that ever existed before, which is why I'm getting so excited that it's also getting very close. So, it's a perfect example of where a linear congruential number generator can be useful and come in handy. You, you know, because if, for example, there we have zero need for security. You would, you know, you would, you just don't even consider it a random number generator. We just want noise. Okay, so picking up on this on, on this team's investigation, they said the Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> oh, I love this, Leo. The Bitcoin blockchain is basically a large public mine of ECDSA signatures. Oh. <laughs> In fact, they wrote, ECDSA has been used as the default signature algorithm since Bitcoin's creation in 2009. We know that in principle, most ECDSA signatures in the Bitcoin network are ephemeral. That's what I was mentioning before. In the sense that the generating secret key is only used once. But we also know that this practice is not always in place, especially for the older transactions. And also, Bitcoin has the advantage that the blocks follow a temporal history, which puts a certain degree of order on the signature generation, although that's only approximate because there's no way to determine the order in which signatures in the same block were generated, since the timestamp is only recorded for a block, not per signature. They said, the problem is that these are mainly speculations, and we have no clue how accurate all these speculations are. So, it's time to verify. We downloaded, they wrote, and installed Bitcoin Core, the official Bitcoin client, and let it synchronize the whole chain. <laughs> Get a load of this. The sync process took about a day on a fast fiber connection and the total blockchain size was about 430 gigabytes up to block number seven seven hundred and fifty two thousand seven hundred and fifty nine on september 5th 2022 it's bigger today yep uh-huh <sighs> dumping all the signatures and original messages from the raw blockchain data took 24 hours. The resulting output file size was 271 gigabytes and contained 763,020,390 unique signatures. This file contained on each line the output address the elliptic curve DSA signature RNS values, public key, transaction ID, original message, and block timestamp. We grouped the signatures by public key and then within each group, sorted signatures by timestamp to have more chances of picking consecutive ones. At this point, we had a data set ready to run the attack. But first, here are some statistics about the data set. And actually, these are important, so I included them. They said, these signatures were produced by private keys associated with 
549,744 unique public keys. Okay, so 424 million plus unique public keys. Of those 442 million public keys, 390 million, or about 92%, produced only one signature. That's good, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, exactly. Remember that for Bitcoin, private keys are supposed to be ephemeral and are supposed to only be used once. So it's to be expected that 92% of all those signatures would use a completely unique key. Well, you'd like it to be 100%. You would. Yeah. Uh, that means there's still hope here. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that means that there's no attack possible on those since, you know, these guys are looking for weak nonces occurring during key reuse with the same private key. So they needed to find instances where multiple signatures used the same key. And they did. They wrote. There were 34 million public keys with at least two signatures that used in at least two signings, two signatures, Mm -hmm. 18 million with at least three signatures, 12 million with at least four signatures, 9.6 million with at least five signatures, and 7.8 million with at least six signatures. And they said... So that means six uh, uh, seen elsewhere, five seen elsewhere, duplicating six other signatures. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, so that th- th- that is to say, the same private the the same private key was used to sign six transactions. You have a collision with six transactions when you'd expect to have no collisions in trillions of transactions, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So they said there was a considerable number of public keys with over 200,000 signatures. Ooh. <laughs> Ow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody just didn't ever change their public key uh, or or their 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 private key because the the, the private key and the pub public keys match, right? You right. Get, it, it's a one for one relation. The public key associated with the most signatures <laughs> had 3.4 million oh my God. signatures. Yeah. So there was one key Shared by 3.4 million accounts. They um, had the same public one, key. One, one key used in 3.4 million transactions. Transactions, not accounts. Okay. Right. Transactions. Transactions. Okay. So they said the, uh, the attack is generic and can be run with at least N equals four. That is to say where you've got a single, a, a single, private key used in at least four transactions, N equals four signatures, and they call that the linear case. That, 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 that is to say, if N equals four, then they're solving a, a linear function. Okay. But can also be run with more signatures. And the more you have, the better your chances. Course, they said, for yeah. example, five signatures for the quadratic case and six signatures for the cubic case. Or even more signatures. So it gets easier to, to crack with more signatures. It Actually, it gets harder to crack, but more likely. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so so they said the linear case will also detect repeated nonces, but is the, it is more general because it can exploit any linear recurrence mm. relation. They said, however, we wanted to go even further and run the quadratic case with n equals 5 because we thought it might give more interesting results. We considered the cost-benefit ratio of performing cubic or higher order attacks to not be worthwhile. So we stopped at the quadratic case. So they'd cost too much compute time. Right, exactly. Meaning batches of five signatures. But notice if you had, if you, if you, you're doing five at a time, but if you had seven signatures, you could slide a window along those seven, taking them t- taking them five at a time, uh. right? So they said, since we sometimes have more than five signatures associated with a given public key, we decided to perform a sliding window over the signatures 
sorted by timestamp and run the attack on each window of size n, where n equals 5. So, they said, how did it go? We ran the sliding window attack with n equals 5 on a 128 core VM, and it was completed in 2 days and 19 hours. The estimated cost of the attack was about 285 U.S. dollars. Probably did it in the cloud. Okay. Well, they did. Yeah. We broke 762 oh. unique wallets. Oh, is mine in there? <laughs> oh, please. I don't think so because, although you probably haven't checked yours. No. I don't know even these, know how to run this attack. I, the, right. Yeah. All of these had a zero balance. Oh. Oh. Because... They were not the first people there, Leo. Oh. They'd already been drained. Yes, they said, <gasps> interestingly enough, we could break all these wallets, not because of a linear or quadratic recurrence, but because there was at least one repeated nonce in the signatures. So... They wrote, it looks like the common mishap of ECDSA implementations using a repeated nonce was the cause of the trouble. Oh, so they went to all this effort to try yep. to find a very sophisticated attack. Yep. And what they really uncovered was there was a trivial attack, which had already yep. been uncovered and used. Yeah, exactly that. <gasps> wow. In other words, these guys developed a highly sophisticated and subtle attack which they showed would have worked and which would have been able to detect subtle failures in nonce choice. But what they stumbled upon oh, during wow. this work was the biggest no-no in the use of elliptic curve DSA, which is a single reuse ever of a nonce when signing under the same private key. Wow. This meant that a trivial attack against those wallets was possible. And what's more, Somebody had already done that. And, Leo, they tracked him down. Oh, my. Uh, oh, my. Because the bit, the, you know, it's a ledger, right? Well, Because so you, you can... transfer the stuff from this account into another account. Exactly. And that account number is not private. It's not hidden. Ex it's public. Exactly. It's, the, it's, it's a public It's a blockchain. public ledger. <gasps> they said. This is exciting. All... This is great. <laughs> we could have made a whole podcast series out of this. This should have been. <laughs> Security Now Season 20. This could have been amazing. <laughs> Keep going. This is great. They said, um, so, since they said, since we only ran the attack uh, using a window of size 5 so far, we may have missed a few vulnerable wallets that would only have been found for public keys that had exactly four signatures. So, we reran the attack with N equals 4 on only the signatures from wallets with exactly four signatures. We were able to break 11 new wallets with a zero balance and at huh. least one repeated nonce, thus increasing the total amount of broken wallets to 773. But they, so in other words, they didn't find any new wallets because again, there was a, you know, they, 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 they were finding a, a superset and it turned out, well, there was other uh, repeated nonce instances. So, unfortunately, there were a bunch of people out there who had a bad, you know, who had a, who had a bad Bitcoin client that was reusing nonces um, when they were doing transactions, and they lost all their money. They said, we suspect, and in some cases have evidence, and they said, as we will discuss later, that all these wallets have zero balance because they have already been hacked in the past due to the repeated nonce vulnerability. We also estimated the total theoretical amount of tokens that may have been stolen from these 773 wallets to be... 484 Bitcoin at a value of approximately 31 million oh. U.S. dollars oh. at Bitcoin's peak. Well, one thing that's good is uh, since I know there's still Bitcoin in my wallet, I'm not one of those. You're not. Yes. Duplicated nonce wallets. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So anyway, I uh, th- th- then they go on at length uh, talking about various other attacks. Uh, those are the rabbit holes that they refer to, and they talk about all the evidence of, you know, they identified a number of actors, and they found the person who, wow. uh, you know, uh, the, the Bitcoin address that, that essentially made these transfers. Anyway, they, they conclude saying, so since we aren't sipping mojitos on a beach in some exotic location... <laughs> You can tell we did not gain access to Satoshi's wallet, <laughs> but we recovered. Well, they the might private... have. It's just that somebody got there first. It could, I guess. Oh, not. yeah. I actually, guess doesn't not, Satoshi say... have an insane number oh, yeah, of bitcoins? Billions, billions and billions yeah. of dollars. Yeah. yeah. So he, they, they said, we recovered the private key of some Bitcoin wallets showing that the attack works. We only scratched the surface by looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some TLS connections. With this initial look, we wanted to ensure that an attacker could not cause financial damage before releasing the details. But there are many other locations where elliptic curve DSA is used, such as additional blockchains, batches of PGP signatures, other TLS connections, and embedded devices, just to name a few. We release this information along with code so that people and organizations can proactively ensure they are secure against these attacks and create more robust systems. We hope you find this useful. What would be your fix for this? Somebody's asking in the chat room. It wouldn't be changing your password. You'd probably transfer it out of your old wallet, make a new wallet, and transfer it into a newer wallet where presumably this nonce you, won't be reused. So, yes, yeah, so you absolutely, well, so nonce reuse is never a problem if as long as you're do as long as you're not reusing your private key. The easy thing to do oh. is make sure you get a new private key for, e- for, for every transaction. Okay, okay. Yes, and that's why 93% or 92%, whatever it was, of all transactions are using unique private keys. Mm. Everyone should have a client doing that. Okay. In the, in the earliest days... People were not doing that. So these are all older wallets, yeah. yeah. Yes, they, 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 well, they older transactions. Transactions, right? And so, so those would have been older transactions using older uh, Bitcoin clients. I wonder if Bitcoin Core now. I'm sure it now rekeys each time. I would. Given that 92 percent of all transactions are that, that must be the case. And they're and they're supposed to be, but they're you know they're not always. Right. You know, again, everybody you know, there's like all these different Bitcoin gizmos out there, right. and some of them just aren't well made, and some of them apparently not only are they you re not bothering to to use a, a new private key for every transaction, they're also who knows how, how could you reuse a nonce. How how could you get anything that you thought was even that you even thought was supposed to be <laughs> random and had get it twice. Wow. 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 So, you know, there are a couple of takeaway lessons here. One is that details really matter, right? The crypto gurus who invent and create these algorithms admonish their implementers that if they want to take advantage of the elegant, though quite finicky, ECDSA algorithm, they're going to really need to be double damned certain to only ever use it with truly high quality random nonces in an application where they need to have a static signature and most signature most elliptic curve dsa signatures are static right it's like if you have an elliptic curve um uh, uh tls certificate that's not changing so you're depending in that instance on the quality of the nonce being highly random but so the point is yes it's a great algorithm but you got to use it correctly. And the second takeaway, take I think, is in the form of a question. If details like that really matter that much, if a critical algorithm is so brittle and sensitive to difficult-to-control implementation mistakes, should it be chosen mm. and used mm-hmm. in critical applications? You know, because it's no longer the case that only one of these is ever made. Bitcoin went crazy and everybody said, oh, I'm going to create a wallet. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to create my, you know, my own because why not? Let's write it in JavaScript. (laughs) So, you know, uh, 
uh, should it be chosen and used in critical applications, such as to protect the storage of hundreds of billions of dollars in cryptocurrency wealth? And by the way, I was curious if anybody else is. Uh, as to, uh, as of the beginning of this year, total wealth stored in cryptocurrency was eight hundred and four billion dollars, mm. with around three hundred and twenty billion of that in Bitcoin. Mm. So, you know, this is the sort of way these things happen, right? Uh, we see it over and over. The inventors of the packet switching internet could have never foreseen what their experiment grew into. And yes, for all that it's amazing, it also has some weaknesses in the face of deliberate abuse. And with Bitcoin, as a proof of concept, Satoshi invents and designs an intriguing system. And he chose elliptic curve DSA to sign transactions because sure, it's the best, though it also needs to be handled with extreme care. Little could he have possibly known what his experiment would to grow into. And in retrospect, choosing something less fragile, some less fragile crypto would have probably been a better choice for something that has, you know, was to grow into a global phenomenon. And of course, he could have never predicted what was to come. So I use uh, curve 25519. That's an elliptic curve, but that's not, it's different. That's probably not using... Uh, DSA. Right. Uh, well, although it is the default signing, uh, uh, so we would have to look and see uh, which of the, so, so uh, 25519 is one particular very popular elliptic curve. Mm -hmm. There are other elliptic curves, um, but, but all of them uh, then share the, the same set of algorithms right. uh, on these, uh, which are put on these different elliptic curves. So I use it in my with SSH primarily. I shouldn't be announcing this, but that's what I use primarily use it for. Yeah, every I mean uh, that that that's what Squirrel uses. Yeah, same. I I, yeah. I also chose two five five nineteen. It's, it's also because the keys are short and easily copied and pasted. Uh, in my case, it was because it had some particular proper, uh, properties that Dan Bernstein, who is the inventor of of two five five nineteen. Uh, it's got some really cool properties that enable the use of, you know, en enabled squirrels crypto. Yeah. Okay, I won't worry. Very cool. And I and since my coins are still in my wallet, I guess I don't have to worry about this attack either. Nope. Uh, well, nope. it doesn't really nope. matter. I can't get to them anyway. So. <laughs> uh, I think we're at an hour and eighteen. Let, yeah, let's, let's take, take a break. Our third yeah, yeah, break, yeah. And then we will continue. Yeah. And you know what? If if the wallet had, it had been emptied, I would say, well, I'm glad somebody got the use of. It. <laughs> oh lord what a world huh this uh this uh episode of security now brought to you by a great sponsor we love so much plex track the purple teaming platform plex track is your security team's secret weapon the premier cybersecurity reporting and collaboration platform it transforms the way cybersecurity work gets done uh, if you've got a red team, if you've got a blue team, if you've got a purple team, you need Plex Track. You know, you do assessments. If you do pen testing, you make reports, you need Plex Track. If you're ready to gain control over all those tools you use, all that data you're generating in your, in your pen testing and your security testing, if you're in, interested in building more actionable reports and then allowing you to focus on the right remediation, if you're working to mature your security posture but struggling to optimize efficiency and f facilitate collaboration within your team, I got the solution for you, PlexTrack, P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C. It's a powerful and yet easy-to-use cybersecurity platform that centralizes all your security assessments, your pen test reports, your audit findings, your vulnerability tracking, it transforms the risk management lifecycle. Let's your security team generate better reports with less typing, faster. You can aggregate and visualize analytics. Yeah, it's very visual. You can collaborate on remediation in real time. It just streamlines the security process. How does it do it? Well, the PlexTrack platform has addressed specific pain points 
within the spectrum of security team workflows. Things like, well, let's talk about offensive testing. It's second to none for managing your offensive testing uh, and then reporting security findings. And when I say report, I don't mean just like a lot of paragraph of prose. I mean code samples and screenshots. Even videos could be added to any finding. You can import findings from all the tools you use, Nessus, Burp, whatever you use. You can export to custom templates with a click of a button. So once you've set up that template, it's really easy to get the reports in there. Analytics and service level agreement functions let you visualize your security posture so you can quickly assess and prioritize. Make sure you're tracking remediation efforts to show progress over time. It's got complete built-in compatibility with all the industry tools that you would use or frameworks, including vulnerability scanners and pen testing as a service platforms and bug bounty tools and adversary emulation plans. It lets you improve the effectiveness and efficiency of your current workflow. Robust integrations with Jira and ServiceNow mean you're always closing the loop on the highest priority findings, fixing those tickets. Enterprise security teams can use PlexTrack to streamline their pen tests, their security assessments, their incidents, response reports, and much more. PlexTrack clients tell us they love it. Up to 60% reduction in time spent reporting, a 30% increase in efficiency, and a 5x ROI in year one. All in all, PlexTrack provides a single source of truth for all stakeholders transforming the cybersecurity management life cycle. So here, here's what I want you to do. Book a demo today. You you will see how much time PlexTrack can save you. Try PlexTrack free for one month. See how it can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of your security team. All you have to do is go to PlexTrack.com slash twit. Claim that free month, P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash T-W-I-T. PlexTrack your security team's secret weapon. And we thank them so much for supporting security now. I hope we got the message out. And if you heard it and you want to try it out, please do us a favor and use that special address so they know you saw it here. Plextrack.com slash twit. Slash twit. All right? Fair enough. Now, let's get on with the show, Mr. Gibson. Now, there is no relation between Plextrack... And the Plex Media Server. No. Uh, oh, just let's hope make not. that clear. <laughs> oh, no. Last week, we were talking about the growth of CIS's KEV database, uh, you know, where KEV is the abbreviation for known exploited vulnerabilities. And how, while it grew much faster last year than in any previous year, an examination of the dates of the CVEs that were added during this most recent past year revealed that the large majority of these were not new problems being exploited, oh, but rather okay. old problems that had never been patched. Mm. So I noted that CISA had just added CVE 2020 5741. 2020. That's three years 20, old. That's, that's three years right. old. And what is 5741, you might ask? Well, it's a deserialization flaw of untrusted data, which was found, as we noted, three years ago in the Plex Media Server for Windows. But who would be, who would be running three-year-old unpatched versions of Plex on their Windows machines? Who indeed? Who indeed, my friend? It happened that an unfortunate LastPass developer... Oh. Yes, was doing so after which a distinct lack of fortune was visited upon all LastPass <laughs> users. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> a remote, unauthenticated attacker is able to execute their arbitrary Python code on the victim's oh, computer. Can we make it any easier? Holy so cow. So we now, now we know that this developer was using a publicly exposed Plex Media Server, which was three years out of date since, of course, CVE 2020-5741 had been found, was known, and had been fixed. I've been saying for a while now that any serious cyber warfare agency or group across the globe must be maintaining 
a vulnerability and exploit database indexed by target vendor. So in the instance of this second LastPass attack, LastPass's developers were identified, probably with the aid of the first attack on that developer network, right? Then they were tracked down and identified at home, and their home IP addresses were scanned. When port 32400 was found to be accepting inbound TCP connections at one of those IPs, that port was looked up, and the Plex Media Server was found to be the most common user of that port. Then, the attacker's master vulnerability and exploit database was queried for Plex, and a three-year-old remotely exploitable vulnerability stood out. Could we be this lucky, the attackers probably thought to themselves, and indeed, they were, and we weren't. I know a little Python. I think I could take advantage of this, Governor. <laughs> That's right. And I don't know if anything was more has been learned, but I did hear something about North Korea being the oh, uh, really? the, pres the presumed source of the attack. Yeah. The thing that makes me scared, it was so clearly targeted against oh, LastPass. Boy. Yeah. And that means they knew what they wanted, which is the vaults, which means, I presume, they knew what to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the reason uh, we're no longer all using LastPass. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Uh, uh, one quick random note, and then we're going to talk about Sony suing Quad9. I wanted to mention Andor, Leo. Yeah. It's good, isn't in it? A in a word, wow. Yeah. And, and, of course, there'll be no spoilers here. But I want to set the stage a little bit and give our listeners just a bit of background to raise their curiosity level. Uh, and if you're someone who wants to hear absolutely nothing in advance, then skip forward 60 seconds. Andor presents the story of an orphan, Cassian Andor. The series is set well before the events of Luke and his princess sister. It tells the story of the early rise of the Empire as it gradually displaces corporate rule for imperial rule and tightens its grip on the galaxy's citizenry, which is increasingly becoming stratified into upper and lower castes. Mostly, Cassian just wants to be left alone. He grew up hard and survives by reselling tech that he steals from around the fringes of the Imperium. Despite being raised by an adopted mother who's been seeing what's happening to the galaxy and wants to rebel, he has zero interest in any cause. He holds no such ideals. He just wants to be left alone and not be told what to do. Over the course of these first 12 beautifully crafted episodes, we watch that change. If you don't already subscribe to Disney+, Plus. I cannot imagine that you would regret subscribing just long enough to watch this first 12 season or 12 episode season. Uh, there might even be a free you know, trial period available to new subscribers. I was not offered one because a year or two ago, after watching the first season of The Mandalorian, I canceled my subscription. The Mandalorian wasn't horrible. And Lori loved Baby Yoda. I kept hearing, oh, but neither did it strike me as being all that great. It's just a rubber puppet. <laughs> That's so cute. Oh, anyway, but Andor is another thing entirely. And Leo, I think that this very sober and serious series may be the best Star Wars property I've ever watched. I agree. And I, I think it is because... It's very little Star Wars, <laughs> in a way, right? Right. There's no, there, there's no. Who is that? Usa Usa Gusa no, thing? That, no, none with of the that floppy stuff. Ears. No uh, there, there Jar Jar. No, e no. The Jar Jar Binks. There's no Ewoks. There's I haven't seen the last episode yet, but I don't even think there's any lightsabers. Maybe there is uh, towards the end, but oh, but Leo, that the that fight scene in the second oh, to last episode, so good. Oh my God, so good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's and a number of people told me this. It's a good Star Wars show if you're not if you don't really want a Star Wars movie, 
But but there is that undercurrent which you mentioned of we're seeing the be rise of the empire. So yes. if you're a Star Wars fan, you'll like it. And there's a lot of you know there's Tie Fighters, there's Star Wars technology in it. But uh, yeah, and, and it's a Lori good said, story. As Laurie said, it has a lot of pew 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 pew. pew. <laughs> it does, and the stormtroopers <laughs> are still lousy shots. But okay, um, you know, oh yeah, I thought it was really 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 good. Yeah. Very, very anyway, good. so you know, w w we talked about the expanse. We love the expanse. Uh, this is, and, and again, if you hate Star Wars, I would say I think you're right, Leo. Forgive it for being set in that universe. Yeah, because it's barely I mean, Star and, Wars. And yeah. the other thing I thought was really interesting is the rebels are shown to be they're just as ruthless as the Empire in their own way. I mean, it's not it's not you know sugar coated and lollipops. It's it's, it's a it's more of a gritty kind of yeah. real somebody says like a spy story it is it's a little more like it would be a if you took away the star tour star wars trappings it'd be the same story same show oh and and boy it is it, it, there are some people you love to hate i mean they're Ooh, they're, yeah. they're just beautiful there's some bad people in it bad. yeah yeah so by all means watch the last one it, it has a great ending you won't be disappointed yeah yeah no i've been saving it and I just can't wait for the next season. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I chose the news of Sony's lawsuit against a well-known and well-respected DNS provider because a very dangerous legal precedent threatens to take hold on the Internet. Here's how the defendants, Quad9, summarized the situation and its danger. They wrote, Sony Music Entertainment Germany is litigating against Quad9, requiring us to block access to a website that links to a site containing files that Sony asserts are violating their copyright. We maintain that Sony's request essentially amounts to content censorship and risks cracking the foundations of a free and open Internet in Europe and potentially worldwide. Censorship, in turn, can lead to undue restrictions on freedom of speech. Um, I just, I'll, I'll just briefly say that for, the, for those of our listeners who were not here, Leo, for episode 12 of this podcast... This is not the first time Sony has earned some negative coverage. Uh, and oh, been I'm named starting to hate in, them, to be honest. In this, po in this podcast's yeah. title. Yeah. Episode 12, dated November 3rd, 2005, ran all of 24 minutes. Its title was Sony's Rootkit Technology, DRM, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Copy Protection Gone Bad. 24 minutes, really? <laughs> That's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you said, hey, Steve, why don't you come, you know, maybe just like half an hour and tell us what's been going on every week. Yeah, yeah, not much to say, yeah, but right. we do it in half an hour. Yeah. Since those early days, Sony has had their troubles, and they do tend to be litigious when they can find someone, anyone, to sue. Um, they're happy to throw their, their weight around without much provocation. So now to this issue today. We've talked about Quad9 in the past. They're a bunch of good people. Quad9 is a free, global, public recursive DNS resolver, meaning that anyone in the world can ask them to look up the IP address associated with a domain, and they will do that by asking whatever other DNS resolvers may be needed to come up with the final answer, thus recursive. But Quad9 is also explicitly a filtering DNS resolver, in fact, that's its purpose. It aims to protect its users by not returning the IP addresses of sites known to be malicious. Quad9 is operated by the Quad9 Foundation, a Swiss public benefit nonprofit foundation headquartered in Zurich, Switzerland, whose sole purpose is improving the privacy and cybersecurity of Internet users. Quad9 has 200 points of presence globally spread around 90 countries for which they provide these services to individuals and organizations at no charge. Here's the language from the court, which supports the position that Sony's attorneys have described. This is 
this is taken directly from the official court order. They said the defendant is ordered to refrain from selling on the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany the music album Evanescence, The Bitter Truth. Fine. With the sound re- Fine. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Don't want it. Don't want it. Happy not to not not to sell that. With the sound recordings contained thereon to be made publicly available by the defendant providing its users with a DNS resolver service, which the domain <coughs> excuse me, canna C A N N A dot T O and or the subdomain uu.cana.to, it translates into numeric IP addresses so that it is possible for the users of the defendant with the help of these numerical IP addresses to reach the Internet service under the domain cana.to and or the subdomain uu.cana.to and or the further domains and to call up their links to unlawful storage of the album, as happened by the defendant offering its users the DNS resolver service Quad 9 at the IP address 9.9.9.9, with the help of which the users with the links, and then the court order has four links, two of them are uu.cana.to links, you know, with some you know, uh, uh, specification of in the URL and canna.sx and canna.power.to. They said numeric IP addresses were transmitted, which enabled them to access the hyperlinks provided at the aforementioned addresses to the storage locations of, and then there's two links at shareplace.org, and some some hex stuff. So that's the actual pirate site, shareplace.org, that is offering up this material. And they finish, and call up the illegally stored copies of the aforementioned album. So, in other words, there's no misunderstanding here with the court about the essentially passive role that DNS and a DNS service provides. Another piece of the official proceedings was also interesting. They described the efforts that Sony first went through in doing what we would all agree was the right thing for them to do. Here's what the document, the court document describes. They said, music content is listed and categorized under the domain www.cana.to. The domain of the website is Canna Power. In a letter dated March 23rd, 2021, okay, so note that this has been going on for two years, the plaintiff, meaning Sony, drew the defendants, meaning Quad9, attention to the infringement and also pointed out the URL. The defendant was requested to put an end to the infringement. The defendant... Quad 9 was warned after it failed to remedy the situation. The plaintiff, Sony, had made every, uh, here it is, the plaintiff had made every conceivable effort to remove the infringing offer with the involvement of primary liable parties. The Canna Power website has no imprint. Entries on the, on the domain owner were also not available. Oh, requests for deletion to the hosting provider went unanswered. Oh, no, nobody answered the phone. Their two IPs were named. The company Infinium UAB, with an administrative and technical contact in the Ukraine, was identified as the responsible organization. The company was allegedly based in uh, Vilnius, Lithuania. There, however, a delivery by courier could not take place due to the lack of a traceable signature. 
in Ukraine. Delivery was not possible because the address was located in a high security area to which it was not possible to accept deliveries without express consent. This consent had been refused. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, the actual copyright infringers are out of reach of Sony's wrath. From from what the court wrote, it doesn't really sound as though Sony tried that very hard to go after the primary sources. The court wrote that Sony had made every conceivable effort to remove the infringing offer with the involvement of primary liable parties. But Canna Power's hosting provider, what, didn't answer the phone? No so that was there. it. We can't, we can't serve them. Yeah, we go. Oh. So Sony, unwilling to be stymied and denied, decided to attack someone who was within their reach. The court wrote, the plaintiff is of the opinion, that is Sony, <laughs> is of the opinion that the defendant is liable as a tort feasor. Now, I had to look that one up. The short, the short version of the definition of tort feasor is a tort feasor is a person or entity who is found to be responsible under civil law for an injury caused to another person or entity, unquote. In other words, Sony is claiming that because Quad9 provides some of the Internet glue mechanics that are required for users to reach the Canna Power website, given its domain name, and, and, and note only Quad9 users, not all, not all the rest of us, they, Quad9, are thereby responsible under civil law for the injury caused to Sony. Wow. The court wrote, according to recent case law, it, meaning Quad9, is also liable as a perpetrator of a copyright infringement. Okay, now, unfortunately, we would not be talking about this insanity if saner heads had prevailed and, you know, today's podcast would then have a different title. The final decision of the Leipzig District Court was to rule in Sony's favor, ordering Quad9 to block all access to the can to Canna Power domains globally. Now, as we all know, Quad9's action of complying with this court order will have zero effect on anyone who does not have 9.9.9.9 .9 configured as their DNS resolver. All of the rest of us, of course, it won't have any effect on those people anyway, listening to this podcast, because we're, we're not going to be pirating music from Canna, Canna Power. All of the rest of us can access those Canna Power URLs without any trouble. So this action by Sony only makes any sense if this is just the first such legal actions which Sony intends to use um, as to set a precedent, a legal precedent for other similar actions against other DNS providers. And that's another thing that doesn't, doesn't really make any sense because the world is also full of DNS providers, many of whom do not care and couldn't care less about making Sony happy. And they're not going to take this action. What would have made much more sense from a technology standpoint would have been for Sony to contact the responsible and definitely reachable top level domain provider for the .to TLD. .to is the Internet Country Code top level domain for the Kingdom of Tonga and is administered by the Tonga Network Information Center. And they do pick up the phone. By changing the DNS name server entries for those Kana Power domains, DNS would have disappeared globally once downstream caches expired. But that's not what Sony chose to do. Five days after this judgment, which came down on March 1st, presumably having recovered from the decision, Quad9 posted their response. They said, Quad9 has been part of a potentially precedent-setting legal case involving Sony Music. On March 1st, Leipzig Regional Court ruled in favor of Sony Music. 
This ruling means that Quad 9 has no choice but to block the domains in question at a global scale as directed by the court. That said, Quad 9 is far from ready to give up the fight in terms of protecting users' access to information. Quad 9 is shocked that the court ruled in favor of Sony Music, but they are not disheartened and will continue fighting for the freedom of access to information by citizens around the globe. Quad 9 feels they were chosen as a target because, as a nonprofit player with a limited budget and small market share, Sony potentially did not expect Quad 9 to have the means of fighting back. This would be an easier means of a this would be an easier means of establishing legal precedent to potentially control domains served by all DNS recursive resolvers. Although Quad 9 is complying with the ruling in the interim, there are several points that they feel should be brought to the attention of citizens around the globe who value privacy and freedom of access to information on the Internet, as the potential implications of the ruling could reach a global scale. German court decisions are normally limited to Germany, which is why Quad 9 has implemented GOIP on its infrastructure in Germany to restrict the domain names in question from being resolved for users querying from Germany. However, there are loopholes, such as VPNs, beyond Quad 9's control. The court deemed this not to be sufficient. The court's decision ignored the VPN concept and implies that Quad 9 must block these domains regardless of how users reach them or from what nation those intentionally disguised queries originate. Quad 9 believes this is an exceptionally dangerous precedent that could lead to future global reaching commercialization and potential political censorship if DNS blocking is applied globally without geographic limitations to certain jurisdictions. The court did not apply the rules of the German Telemedia Act, consequently, which sounds a little bit like our Section 230, said they said, consequently, Quad 9 does not enjoy the associated limitations from liability. Quad 9 also believes that it should benefit from these exemptions from liability, particularly since the European lawmakers have noted in the recently adopted Digital Services Act that providers of services establishing and facilitating the underlying logical architecture and proper functioning of the Internet, including technical auxiliary functions, can also benefit from the exemptions from liability and explicitly mentioned providers of DNS services. In other words, it sounds like they have a strong case here on appeal. The court established that Quad 9 accepted the wrongdoer liability. Quad 9 feels this application of the wrongdoer liability is absurdly extreme given the circumstances. To, and that must make an exception to the German Telemedia Act. To put this into perspective, applying wrongdoer liability in this setting is akin to charging a pen manufacturer with fraud because a stranger forged documents while using the manufacturer's writing utensil. Yeah. Anyway, I agree they go that. on. But, it's you know, very annoying. I mean, it is really, really wrong. So, um, oh, and I wanted to share one additional posting uh, that Quad 9 published uh, two days later, since it contains some important points and principles about responsibility with DNS. They said, the Sony Music Entertainment Germany versus Quad 9 Foundation case has brought to light a concerning issue regarding the implementation of blocking measures by DNS recursive resolvers. In addition to concerns around sovereignty and judicial overreach, it is essential to recognize that DNS recursive resolvers are not the appropriate place to implement this type of blocking. DNS recursive resolvers play a crucial role in the functioning of the Internet by translating domain names into IP addresses. However, they should not act as gatekeepers for content, which can be subjective and varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Users of Quad 9 opt in to our service and want the cyber protection that we enable for them. 
Blocking a domain for distributing malware is motivated by the desire to protect users from malicious or harmful content, such as viruses, phishing scams, or other threats. These types of protective DNS services, blocking a domain for malware, is a form of user opt-in filtering. The intention is to protect users from harm and does not necessarily involve restricting access to specific types of content. Blocking a website based on its content is censorship, since it involves restricting access to specific information based on someone else's standards or values, rather than allowing individuals to choose what content they wish to access. Most people would like to avoid ransomware on their computers. Still, they might want to browse a website with a specific set of content or an ideological perspective with which we disagree. Blocking a website based on some or all of its content is often motivated by a desire to restrict access to specific types of content. Recognizing that DNS recursive resolvers are not the appropriate place to implement content blocking measures is critical. Arbitrary blocking of content-related domains places an undue burden on DNS recursive resolvers to police online content. DNS recursive resolver operators don't have the legal expertise or access to additional information that might be required to decide what content is legal or illegal. And finally, in this ruling, DNS recursive resolvers end up with more culpability and liability for content than social media networks. Concerns around copyright infringement and online privacy are valid, and the courts should address them in appropriate venues. Finding solutions that do not compromise Internet users' security and respect other nations' sovereignty is crucial. So, Oh, and in a, in a little, in a one line, one sentence uh, transparency report that they published, they said Quad 9's domain blocking policy blocks malicious domains associated with phishing malware, stalkerware, and command and control botnets. Our threat intelligence data comes from trusted cybersecurity partners, not arbitrary corporations or governments. Our policy has been to block malicious domains and not moderate content disputes. So I am certainly glad that they're going to appeal the decision. And I hope that this ruling will have caught the attention of many other larger entities who share a vested interest in not allowing this single ruling to establish what is clearly the wrong precedent. It, you know, it's so clear that pursuing legal remedies against the actual publisher of the infringing material, which is what it, we've always done before, right? I mean, that's, that's what's happened before. That's the right thing to do. The law should not be about the easy target. It should be about the infringing target. The fact that it may be difficult to hold the infringer to account should not mean that arbitrary and completely unrelated components of Internet infrastructure should become an alternative an alternative target. You know, that's just nuts. Although, you know, as I'm saying that, Leo, it occurs to me that we have seen a situation where where the the copyright holders are going after the downloaders of the content, right? I mean, they're, well, that's they're, sensible, they're, right? Those are the ones who are actually you're, infringing you're and, and exactly yeah. you're obtaining the content yeah. at, at each end from the person who is serving it and then the person who's consuming it. What the yeah, it's hard for them to do that. They tried a bunch of John Doe, you know, because it's hard to get the identity, right? They have the IP address, that's all they have, and they've tried a bunch of John Doe lawsuits. Remember, that didn't go very well for the music industry. It turned out to be a black mark for them. Then they went after the ISPs, they still do with that three strikes thing. It's a long, right. ugly history. Uh, of and it and as far as I can tell, it's it's accomplished zero, and that's right. really the main thing to say is it doesn't stop piracy. It doesn't work. It just makes it bad for the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh well. Anyway, um, the they are asking for help and support. I'm hoping that you know the EFF and and other yeah. uh, other organizations that have some deep pockets would be able to 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 you know 
to help these guys. And I'll, I'll promise to Sony, I'm never going to download or uh, even listen to an Evanescence album at all, ever. Yep. Congratulations. <laughs> and if yep. and if you're Evanescence, you might want to look for a new label. Yep. Uh, because uh, they're doing this on your behalf. This is what happened. Yep. Is, you, the rec is, the, right. is the artists told the record companies, knock it off. You're punishing our, our, our audience. Our reputation. And, uh, and hurting our reputation. Exactly. Uh, good stuff. Thank you, Steve. This is a good show. A lot of good uh, information. You could easily have made that elliptic curve story the story yep. of the week, but you had two good ones. Two. Yep. Count them, two. And that's why everybody waits with bated breath for Tuesday so they can listen to Security Now. Now, a couple of ways you can do that. Of course, you can watch us do it live if you want the very freshest version. We record the show right after Mac Break Weekly. Usually that's between 1.30 and 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that'd be around about 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2100 UTC. The live stream, audio or video, available at twit.tv slash live. If you're watching live, of course, there's a chat room, a couple of chat rooms chatting live, the IRC at irc.twit.tv. And our club members chat in the Club Twit Discord. That's a great hangout. All of us in there really enjoy it, the social network of the hour. Um, if you would like to be in there and you would like to support us and let you get ad-free versions of all the shows, uh, here's shows you can't hear anywhere else, join the club. It's uh, 7 bucks a month, a very affordable amount of money, a couple of cups of coffee, and you get the warm and fuzzy feeling to know that you're supporting what we're doing here. Just go to twit.tv slash club twit. And a big thank you to all of our club twit members uh, already who have uh, made such a big difference for us. We just relaunched Home Theater Geeks, thanks to the club. It's a club-only uh, cool. uh, uh, show. Um, it was a show we couldn't keep doing because uh, there wasn't a big enough audience, not enough advertising, but we can do it because the club pays for it. God, and Scott is that. a wealth of information. Yeah, I love Scott. And I'm really glad we could get him on. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, after the fact, you can get a copy of this show at twit.tv slash sn. You can also get it from Steve. In fact, Steve has two unique versions of the show you might want to check out. A 16 kilobit audio version for people who just don't want to download anything too big. Maybe even smaller is the human written transcription of the show. That's a great adjunct to the show. You can read along as you listen. You can use it to search. In fact, you can search the whole corpus at Steve's website, grc.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of Steve's Bread and Butter, Spinrite, the world's finest mass storage, maintenance, and recovery utility. Uh, that's there. A lot of freebies, a lot of other great stuff, grc.com. You can leave comments for Steve there. He has a really good active forum. He also has a, a comment form at grc.com slash feedback. You can also DM him on Twitter. His DMs are open. He's at sggrc. Uh, leave your comments there. Uh, let's see what else uh, you can also, there's a YouTube channel dedicated to security. Now, if you want to share a clip, that's probably the easiest way to do it because everybody can watch it and YouTube makes that pretty easy to get a little clip and share it out. That's a good idea. Uh, of course, the easiest way to get it is to subscribe to the RSS feed because that way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available. Uh, the best way to do that is to get a podcast client. Frankly, you don't even need to know the RSS feed URL. You just search for security now. And uh, almost every client will immediately pop up and you can subscribe and get it automatically. Uh, whatever you do, we hope you'll come back and join us next week for another thrilling, gripping edition of Security Now. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, my friend. See you next week. Oh, hey, that's a really nice iPhone you have there. You totally picked the right color. Hey, since you do use an iPhone and maybe use an iPad or an Apple Watch or an Apple TV, well, you should check out iOS Today. It's a show that I, Micah Sargent, and my co-host Rosemary Orchard host every Tuesday right here on the Twit Network. It covers all things iOS, tvOS, HomePod OS, Watch OS, iPad OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer. And we love to give you tips and tricks about making the most of those devices, checking out great apps and services, and answering your tech questions. I hope you check it out. Security now.